Are there any other questions, guys, since I'm taking questions? Go on. What are your thoughts on the Apocrypha? So, the, my, my thoughts on the Apocrypha is that I, I wouldn't call it the Apocrypha, I'd call it a deuterio-canonical book. So, I, I accept the deuterio-canonical books as scripture, but I have no problem with Christians that reject the deuterio-canonical books. Why? Because they're all books from the Old Testament. All Christians use the same 27 books of the New Testament, which means that we all have the same essential beliefs because essential Christian beliefs are rooted in New Testament scripture. And so Christians, when it comes to essentials, have no different authorities. Now, when you look at the early reformers like Calvin and Swingley and Luther, they didn't hate the apocryphal books. They used the apocryphal books and they saw them as good books to read. They just said they weren't scripture, so you don't teach from them in church. And so it's quite acceptable to be a Christian and to accept or reject the Apocrypha because it changes no fundamental Christian belief, i.e. it changes no belief that makes you a Christian. Though it does influence uh, what I would call secondary doctrine. So there's a clear evidence in the Deuterio-Canonical books about praying for the dead, for instance. It's in 2 Maccabees. You know, so it influences some of these secondary doctrines, but not the primary ones. Does that answer your question? Any other questions on any aspect of the Christian faith that people want to learn about? Our history, our doctrines, our values, our politics, our culture, our traditions. Going once. Going twice. I think I, I, think I have one. Go on. You think? I think. Right, come back to me when you know. No, but oh, okay, what's your question? It's, it's somewhat, it's a bit philosophical. It's, well, you, in order to learn the Bible, of course you can read it, but if you don't have enough information in you to have a correct interpretation, correct. we need to appeal to authority. Yep. What do you use to trust that authority? Brilliant. So, and it's a very good question. Like, the, I, I've met too many Christians who've come to this park with all kinds of dodgy beliefs because they've decided that them and their Bible is good enough and that they sit there with their Bible and decide their own doctrine, yeah. right? That's dangerous, right? It, it's, it's a real problem. No Christian is an island and no Christian should seek to read Scripture alone, right? You can believe in Scripture alone, but not you and Scripture alone, right? Because the thing is, all of us, when we come into the church, we always bring the world with us. We always bring the categories of the world and the beliefs of the world and the values of the world. And until we're properly formed in the faith, there is a danger that we read the world into scripture. And we read rather than reading scripture into the world. And so the discipleship goes the wrong way. We form the faith around the world. We don't form ourselves around the faith. We don't form the world around the faith. And so what we need to do when we're reading scripture is to read it in the light of the, the tradition of the church and the reading of the church over 2000 years. And so the church fathers are an authority. The church councils are an authority. Now the brother's question though is, on what can we trust that authority? On what can we trust that authority? And my answer to that is on a few things. One, the promise of our Lord. Our Lord said that there are many things that he wanted to teach us, but we're not ready to hear them, but that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. Now, as Christians, if we believe what the Holy Spirit is teaching, then we believe that the Holy Spirit is active in his church, guiding the church into all truth. And so it is therefore possible for us to find the consistency of truth as threaded through the history of the church, because in that you see the fossilization of the work of the Holy Spirit. And then what you will also see is, is how that, that scripture is, uh, how that teaching has been developed. And you, so you see a, a continuity and that continuity is a witness. And so that's for instance, why I can, I, I, I can call even though Refor the Reformation started only 500 years ago, I can say that Reformed Christians are Christians 
because even though they don't have apostolic churches, they do have apostolic faith. The faith of the apostles is clearly present in reformed churches. They believe in the same Jesus. They worship the same Trinity. They, they believe in the same Savior. They, they believe that they're saved by the same means. And so th they have that same faith. And it's that continuity that goes right back down through history to the early church that is what gives me confidence that the promise of our Lord is true, that his church would never be overcome by the gates of hell, that the Holy Spirit is guiding us into all truth. And that's why we should always read scripture in the light of historical Christian teachings and never ever, like every one of us who's a theologian should aspire to have on their tombstone that I added nothing new to theology. Because there is nothing new to add to theology. All theology was given by the apostles and the prophets and it's there in scripture. It does not require us to come up with some new fancy doctrine rather to find ways that that doctrine applies into today's world. Any other questions? Go on, Rob. Uh, this is, uh, I got saved and uh, committed to Christianity about a year ago. Yeah. And prior to that, I was very into psychedelic drugs and yeah. um, That made me to consider reading the Bible and doing my research, which then debated the church. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what is your opinion? Uh, currently I stand against it if I get this question off. What on because drugs and psychedelics? Psychedelic, like mushrooms. Yeah. Thing, yeah. So, I mean, the thing is, it's, it, it's, a, it's a slam dunk. It's a very easy thing to say that unnatural substances that we create in factories, like LSD, we shouldn't use, right? But there is a, a principle in interpreting scripture called the principle of analogous reasoning so analogous so in scripture it clearly commands us not to be intoxicated to be of sound mind to be sober minded scripture teaches us that when it not to be drunkards or to be to give ourselves over to wine now that's a natural fruit and I believe I'm not an expert because I'm not a chemist, uh, uh, but, but I believe that alcohol is just fermentation, so it's a natural process. But the scriptures warn us against uh, drunkenness uh, and to be sober minded and, 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 and to be in our sound mind. Right then, great. So, by the process of analogous reasoning, we can now apply that same reasoning connected to drinking wine to things that weren't around in apostolic times. And so what wasn't around in apostolic times was things like cannabis use, LSD, cocaine, magic mushrooms. I mean, maybe magic mushrooms were around in ancient times and used by pagans, but certainly not, I don't think, in the areas where scripture was written. Well, analogous reasoning tells us that we shouldn't be using anything that intoxicates us. And so as Christians, analogous reasoning requires that we oppose substance abuse that intoxicates people. Now, the question then is, what counts as intoxication? How far does it go? You know, because the, the, the truth is that to some degree, if you drink a cup of tea or a strong coffee, you're intoxicated because it's an accelerant, it's a stimulant. It changes the chemical makeup in your brain. It shuts off the receptors that tell you, that the chemical that tells you you're tired and you need to sleep. That's a form of intoxicant. When we're talking about being drunkard, we're talking about losing self-control. So it's anything that causes you to lose self-control. And so there may be, maybe, an argument possible that allows for small use of cannabis that is controlled in the same way that we might use wine. Now, I'm not willing to make that argument. I'm just saying within the premises of the Christian worldview, it's possible. 
Because if you're going to argue that you can have a cup of wine and that's not a sin, then there is an analogous reasonable argument that says that if you use a, a reduced, watered-down amount of cannabis that doesn't intoxicate you, that you could smoke cannabis. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I read was that you can drink wine for the enjoyment of having wine, but you can't. The reason you smoke cannabis is to get high. Well, so your intention. Right. Is so let, let let someone else ask a question. Right. Go on. Your comments on the latest Pope Francis statement. Okay, guys. I, I stand by my comments that I made about Pope Francis in Singapore. He was wrong to say what he said. He, as the, 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 the patriarch of the Western Church, as the highest office in Latin Christendom, said publicly uh, that all religions lead to God. That is false teaching. It is bad teaching. And he was wrong to say it. But a few days later, when he was safely back in Rome, he said that there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. And so it's important to say that because it's really easy to lampoon the Pope when he says something wrong. But if he says something right, why aren't we applauding him? But my point to the Pope is that he's, he, he, he has caused confusion by a lot of his public statements because he's, he's trying to work nuance into issues that when he's that high up and when he's speaking to such a big crowd he needs to speak in black and white terms because the nuance isn't translating and he's causing confusion amongst the faithful we've got to be clear as christians there is no salvation outside of jesus christ and that means there is no salvation outside of the church and anyone who teaches anything different from that, either by accident or because he chose his words wrongly, needs to be challenged, especially if they're in high office. Any other questions? So what do I, as a Christian, what do I think of Tommy Robinson? I am a Christian and I think that Tommy Robinson is a, a working class folk hero. And here's why. Here's why. Because when people like him, when people like him were saying absolutely nothing, Muslim grooming gangs were raping thousands of children in the north of England. And people like him were saying nothing. They were silent when children were being raped by Muslim grooming gangs. And do you know who forced it onto the public agenda? Who? Tommy Robinson and the EDL. Yeah. When girls, little children from my community were being raped, all of those middle class cream and cucumber sandwich Christians <laughs> and all of those lily livered, spineless, virtue signaling middle class English people who just want their nice little tea parties and dinner parties and read the Guardian you had absolutely nothing to say nothing. when girls were being raped in the north of England and so I'll take no lecture from the likes of you <laughs> Tommy Robinson isn't a perfect man everybody knows that but anyone from the working classes knows that they're not a perfect man and so we tend to be quite forgiving. God knows I'm not a perfect man. So I don't mind the fact that Tommy Robinson has sometimes not got it right on every statement he made or that sometimes he called it wrong or gave commentary with too much anger or even that he occasionally went outside of aspects of the law because what he did in standing up for those girls that were being raped outweighs in my eyes all of the things that he's done wrong that's fair that's fair that's fair that's fair that's fair that's fair
Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? On any? Go on. Yeah. I know the, uh, the first Crusades were a response to the Muslim uh, aggression, to the famous of that. I was wondering what the next, the next two Crusades yep. that came out Brilliant. of that were about. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. let's be clear. There is a lie being sold in our society that the Crusades were somehow an evil act, that they were a bad thing that they were an example of European colonialism or European aggression. This is a lie from the liberal enlightenment. Every crusade that was ever launched from the first to the last was a response to Islamic aggression. It was a response to Muslims invading Christian land, harassing Christians, persecuting Christian populations, desecrating Christian churches in seeking to invade Christian lands. And so the entire crusade project that was launched against the Islamic world was a response to Islamic aggression. And therefore it was justified. Christians today are still suffering from Islamic aggression. Don't believe me, think that I'm lying. Go and ask the Christians of northern Nigeria. Go and ask the Christians of Iraq. Go and ask the Christians of Syria. Go and ask the Christians of Lebanon. Go and ask the Christians of Armenia. Go and ask the Christians of Cyprus. Go and ask the Christians of northern Kosovo. Christians are suffering at the hands of Islamic aggression today just as they were centuries ago. And Christians who fought in those crusades centuries ago were justified in defending themselves. And Christians who defend themselves today are justified in standing up to Islamist terrorist groups like Hezbollah like Islamist terrorist groups like the Janjaweed, like the Fulani, like the, the Islamist separatists in the Philippines in Mindanao province. And we as Christians should stand with our brothers and sisters wherever they are against whoever is persecuting them. We must not allow the political correctness of our age or the needs of civil society in England to dictate our understanding of international politics. And this is why Putin is a traitor to the Christian faith, because he's used his armies more to attack Christians to the defend them, and he's just said that he's taken the Taliban off the terrorist list. He's normalizing relationship with an organization that makes conversion to the Russian Orthodox Church illegal and punishable by death. So tell me, Christians in Russia, how can you stand with someone who stands against the growth of the church? Our politics must be guided by one compass alone. What makes the church stronger? What defeats the enemies of the church? And granted, there are two types of people, three types of people in this world, those that can, those that can count and those that can't. Because I actually gave you two compasses. But you should use both to decide your political decisions. And nothing else matters. Everything else is subject to those two requirements. Next question, ladies and gentlemen. Next question. That's a broad question, sister. What exactly are we talking about there? Like, most Christians now were getting persecuted like, from the police. Yes. And now the government. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen in this country today an increased aggression to the Christians of the UK. We've seen two-tier policing. 
in how the police manage those pro-terrorists, those pro-Hamas marchers that come through our streets every Saturday, that are allowed to break the law at will, attack people at will, support terrorism openly, call for genocide openly. We've seen the police do nothing when Muslim mobs have marched through our streets carrying machetes in open display and our police have done nothing. And I am friends with at least three people that work inside of the police and two of them are uniformed officers. And both of them have told me that the reason why the police discriminate in the way that they police different communities is because they are afraid. They believe that if they police the Muslim mobs in the same way that they police white working class patriots, that they will cause riots and civil unrest across England. In other words, the police are admitting that they fear general unrest from within the Muslim community. Our elites fear general unrest from within the wider Muslim community. Why is that? Because the liberals are pussies. The liberals are spineless. We need a government that is not afraid to smash down 20,000 doors in England to prove the point that the state will not be intimidated by Islamists. To round up every Islamist that is on the MI5 watch list to demonstrate that the state has the muscle and the will to go after them. We need a government that is willing to deport 10,000 foreign criminals from our prison to make a point that this state is not frightened to stand up for itself. But we will never have such a government whilst we follow the lies of the liberal ideology, the progressive ideology. It is liberalism that is making Western society weak. It is your commitment to liberalism that is ensuring that you are defeated, that you lose. And until you abandon liberalism and embrace the kind of Christianity that preachers like me represent, things will only get worse in England. We Christians have dealt with these Islamists before and we have beaten them before and we can beat them again. These Islamists can be beaten. They are not titans. They are just human beings and all you need is the will to use the power to crush them. Next question. Um, I agree with everything you said. You said that the, the liberal elites are afraid to um, crack down on the, on the kind of Islamists. Why are they letting so many in? Right, ladies and gentlemen. Why are our elites committed to uncontrolled mass migration. I'll tell you why. Because as a society, because of liberalism, we have been committed ideolo ideologically to three poisons. The poison of abortion, the poison of contraception, and the poison of divorce. And since the 1960s, we have been killing tens and thousands of our own children year after year after year we've slaughtered millions of our own citizens and by doing that we have created a demographic crisis across the western world and the elites only care about the economy and in economic terms every one of you represents a GDP point. You represent an economic quota. If we kill millions of our own citizens, 
That's millions of economic points that are not being produced. And so they have to be replaced. And so they are replacing them by mass uncontrolled migration. But let's be clear, mass uncontrolled migration is proving to be a net loss to the British economy. 40% of the people in social housing in London today are foreign imports. 40% on social housing in London are foreign imports. Now it is not racist to point out facts if the facts are true. And if you're on social housing, you are an economic deficit. Most of our 10,000 people inside our prisons are foreign imports. In the, the mass uncontrolled migration is proving to be an economic deficit to the UK. Now, ladies and gentlemen, am I against migration? No. I have migrants who are friends. I work with a migrant every Sunday. I work with two migrants, one from Peru, one from Cyprus. One of my closest friends is a migrant. Sorry, not my closest friend. One of my colleagues here is a migrant from India. I'm not against migration. I'm against uncontrolled migration. I'm against unfiltered migration. That's what I want. I want migration of people that will contribute well to our society, will integrate well to our society. And as we have demonstrated through countless videos, lots of the Muslims who are coming into our society don't want to integrate. They want to reintroduce slavery. They want to reintroduce child marriage. They want to introduce the idea of persecuting Christians and Jews. Do you honestly believe that our country is made richer by their presence? No. Why should we tolerate those values? Why should we tolerate those beliefs? But when you look at Christians who are coming from Africa, Christians from Uganda and Nigeria and the Congo, they come and they work and they contribute and they integrate. We, I'm not against migration. I want intelligent migration. Most, if you most, study, most, most if you study, ladies and gentlemen, every Africans. civil war that has happened in recent years, the civil war in Lebanon, the civil war in Yugoslavia, the civil war in Rwanda, the civil war that happened in Nigeria, the civil war that happened in Syria, the civil war that happened in Libya. What are the common factors of every one of those civil wars? Different beliefs followed with different ethnicities, followed with different values. In other words, groups that were so ideologically separated that when everything went south and went bad, they started to fight one another. We are creating the recipe for a civil war in England and in Western Europe because we are allowing people into our country that actually despise our way of life and are so against what we stand for that they, in the right circumstances, would take up arms against us. When ISIS emerged in the Middle East, in the year when everyone started pouring into ISIS, more Muslims went to fight for ISIS than joined the British Army. We were a net exporter of Islamic terrorism to the Middle East. We have over 20,000 Muslims on the watch list of MI5. 90% of all terrorist plots are Islamic in nature. We have countless examples of Muslims being caught by patriots and by Christians having groomed and arranged to meet minors to have sex with them. How much evidence must we see 
before we are willing to say that liberal multiculturalism has failed and that we need to adopt something different. Well, that something different exists. It is multiculturalism of the Christian sense. Because you see, we Christians have practiced multiculturalism for 2,000 years. We have churches made up of multiple ethnicities. Leaders coming from different cultures and ethnicities guiding different churches of other groups. We Christians need no lectures in what a multiracial society looks like because we Christians have practiced multicultural, multi-ethnic societies for 2,000 years. We know how to make it work. The Liberals don't. Liberals, we don't need lectures from you. You need lectures from us. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I don't know how much you know about the British government are planning some sort of... Uh, they have a plan to send uh, prisoners in the UK to prisons in Albania. Now, are they just, uh, like I said, opening up the gates and sort of let out who they want to let out and then put them to prisoners? Is that a death sentence, potentially? So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite you to move in because just look at that space there. Come in, guys. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to speak quieter. So, the reality is that the British government is now thinking about sending British prisoners in the British prison system abroad because we have a government that doesn't have the will to build more prisons. It's a sign of political weakness that governments are not willing to build sufficient prisons to house the criminal fraternity. And recently we saw with the Labour government the hijacking of the criminal justice system for political ends. The, the recent riots that, were, that occurred obviously did see criminality and criminals should be punished. But the kind of criminals that are being punished are not just those that vandalised or, or committed violent crime, it includes people who put up a tweet with some nasty words. The Labour government has used the, hijacked the criminal justice system to punish white working class people for not voting Labour. That's what it's done. You didn't vote Labour, so we're going to chuck thousands of you in prison. But to chuck thousands of them in prison, what have they gone and done? They've gone and released murderers. They've gone and released rapists. They've gone and released people that have committed violent crime, thieves. That's what they've done. They've emptied out prison places and rewarded criminality. And they're telling prosecutors and they're telling the courts not to send people to prison. Now, most of the people that they've released are going to reoffend. So they're going to be back in within six months and then they're going to pile in a whole bunch of people that they want to throw in there for political reasons and now they created a problem where they're talking about sending criminals abroad. Well, I've got an idea. How about we send all foreign-born criminals back to the country that they came from? There's 10,000 foreign-born criminals in the British system. Let's deport them all right. and say to them that they can't come back in. Yes. Here's another one. Okay. Everyone who enters the country illegally mm. has committed a criminal offence. Right. So let's deport all of those, yes. ladies and gentlemen. And let's use the savings that we've got from that to build bigger prisons to throw actual criminals into prison. Because you don't create deterrence within a criminal justice system by letting criminals out early and by telling the courts not to send people to prison if it can be avoided, which is what Tutia Kia, our tyrant, is doing right now. Any other questions about any aspect of the Christian faith? I don't know.
My thought was, like, I can understand the British judge has to make a decision on his own mind. He can't be told the four reactions. And this is in front of someone what decision he has to make, can it? So therefore, a judge is getting a phone call to say, right, this week, anybody who has been in a riot has to go to prison, even though he was sentenced to Right. So we do have a problem in our in our legal in our criminal justice system in the UK, and that is that there is a, a, a grotesque and obvious duplicitousness by the way that communities are being sentenced. It's, it's, it's two tier judiciary actually, and and the reality is that you can you're more likely to be sent to prison for calling someone a paedophile if you do it in the wrong way, than you are for actually being a paedophile. Like, the, who remembers a certain BBC broadcaster who has been let off having watched uh, pornographic images of children? And bought, he's bought, ten, bought, and, and, and bought them. Yeah. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, if you say in the wrong way that a certain 7th century desert Arab was a paedophile and you say it in the wrong way okay. you could be sentenced to prison for stirring up hatred ah. that ladies and gentlemen is a two-tier justice system yes, it is. and what it does is it undermines trust in our justice system it undermines the idea of law and order and if it continues what will end up happening is that more and more people will go from faith in the institutions to disillusionment with the institutions to contempt for the institutions to rebellion against the institutions. The liberal elites are pushing our country in the wrong way because they are incompetent. Now, I do believe that the courts should be corrected from time to time and attuned to make sure that sentences are appropriate to the crime yeah. if they're not sentencing properly. But there should be a consistency in sentencing so that everybody knows if you commit this crime, this is what you can expect. Yes. But what we've got in our country is that some people are committing some of the same crimes as other people and receiving different kinds of sentences ladies and gentlemen. The one that always sticks in my mind was when a, drunk, a group of, I think it was Somali girls, who had got drunk, uh, attacked someone whilst being drunk, and the judge let them off. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the judge let them off and said that they were not used to being drunk. Or we've got the example of the two people that were prosecuted and in front of a Muslim judge having war logos celebrating Hamas, yes. the Muslim judge let them off. Now that Muslim judge is now under investigation for corruption. Rightly so, he's under review. But I'm telling you that our liberal society is allowing itself to be infiltrated by Islamists who are sympathetic to the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood and they are using our democratic institutions against liberal secularism. And liberal secularism has no answer to this problem because liberal secularism cannot, by its ideological worldview, say that this is a problem. I haven't finished. Christians, however, can say that this is a problem and they can deal with it. And we do need to deal with it because the corruption that you see in places like Tower Hamlets needs to be dealt with and our government is not doing so. Any other questions? Go on. Do we have anything close to a freedom of speech law? Anything like America? The UK does not have freedom of speech. We haven't got freedom of speech in the UK. It's dead. 
The one citadel of freedom of speech in the UK is this corner. That's it. This is the only place. The, 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 uh, this, brother, don't. If you want to debate him, go somewhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have freedom of speech in this country. What we must do, ladies and gentlemen, would you like to debate? Would you like to debate? Right, come here then. Come here then. Come here. Come here then. Come here. No, we're not debating you. Lamy, we're not debating you. I offered him a debate. Lamy, since you're interrupting me, Lamy, you're going to interrupt me. I'm going to interrupt the Dawa. He's panicking, Lamy. Lamy, Lamy, do you want me to interrupt the Dawa? He's going once. Lamy, do you want me to interrupt the Dawa? Going twice. Do you want me to interrupt the Dawa? Make your choice. Do you want me to go and interrupt the Dawa? Right, ladies and gentlemen. He's interrupted me, so now I'm going to interrupt the Dawa. Let's go and interrupt the Dawa. Here we are. I think they're all. Let's see if we can find one.